Good afternoon, friends, family, and colleagues from across the sea. It's Dan Diker from the Jerusalem Center uh, for Public Affairs in the middle of Jerusalem, together with my esteemed colleague, Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Maurice Hirsch, international lawyer and the foreign prosecutor for Judea and Samaria for the IDF. We are bringing you, this is day 13, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of this, uh, what we call post-massacre reality in Israel's uh, very large, unprecedented counterterrorism operation, which has expanded into a full, uh, a full-fledged war, according to uh, Israeli law, and uh, the IDF continues uh, its uh, bombing campaign in in Gaza. We're also dealing with uh, 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 major issues in in the north, and uh, as we can tell you that uh, the IDF is actually waiting, standing ready uh, to start a major ground operation in uh, Gaza. The uh, U.S. President Joe Biden here and gone, uh, and uh, was a, I think it was considered to be a, a positive trip, even though there are expressions of uh, caution and concern uh, regarding uh, the focus of the, uh, of the president of the U.S. administration on the what was called this humanitarian situation in Gaza, which we understand here would be first and foremost releasing the 250 uh, children, women, men who have been kidnapped and held in uh, in massive and gross violation of international law and uh, and human rights. Uh, we want to update you now, as we do every day, as to what the state of play is, if you will. Uh, numbers and uh, a little bit of a quantitative analysis, a little bit of some observations uh, by Maurice. And then we're going to go to a very, very esteemed uh, guest, Dr. Harold Rode, a 28 year veteran, now retired of the, of the uh, US, uh, uh, of the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, a major uh, expert in uh, Middle East, in, in the uh, Arab and Muslim majority countries, particularly Iran. Uh, and we're today uh, and Islam, and today we're going to be talking to Dr. Rode about Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran in the context of Islam. How do they understand uh, their own political identities in terms of Islam, uh, and what constraints and uh, obstacles and perhaps opportunities there are uh, in view of their own self-understanding regarding their uh, identities, their political and collective identities with uh, regarding Islam. Let's go to Maurice right now. Maurice, what's the, the latest update on where we are on day 13? Okay, Dan, so what I want to do is, I know we do this every day, but we'll go over it, and today there's an extra point to it, just to go over the starting numbers and the developing situation. The starting numbers are 1,400 Israelis and a, a, a few foreigners murdered on the first day on the 7th of, of, of October. 3,500 injured, some of them still in hospital, some of them still fighting for their lives. Of those murdered, we still have hundreds of bodies that we are unable at this stage, even after 13 days to identify because of uh, uh, um, the actions of the terrorists and what they did uh, um, to the people, um, burning them alive in some cases, um, tying families together, really atrocities that should never uh, be spoken about. But that's a situation that we're still in and 250 uh, people kidnapped and we're standing now already on day 13 or only on day 13 at 7,000 over 7,300 missile rockets fired at, at Israel. Now, why do I give all those information again? Because our friends at Stand With Us have produced an, an amazing app which allows you to do a comparison of well, what it, would those numbers mean for your country? So, for example, if in America was to, was to suffer an attack like we have suffered on the 7th of October, there would be 52,400 people murdered, 7,486 people kidnapped, 167,000 injured, 3 million rockets, comparing sizes and everything else. United Kingdom, 10,457 murdered, 1,494 kidnapped, another 33,000 injured. Canada, 5,956 murdered, 851 kidnapped, um, 3 million uh, plus rockets. Brazil, let's go to South America a little bit, um, 33,000 people murdered on one day, all this on one day. Um, 4,764 people kidnapped, 2,800,000 uh, uh, 2, uh, uh, rockets. 
and you can go on and on and on around the world. That's uh, um, the comparison. That's on the southern region. We're talking now about the continued aerial bombardment waiting for Israel's ground forces uh, to go in. Just going north a little bit to, 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 to Lebanon. Lebanon, we have to understand, is not quiet at all. Um, just a few numbers uh, uh, for Lebanon. We've had, since the 7th of October, two infiltrations of terrorist forces. Uh, it's called the, the Radwan forces, similar to the, uh, the Luchba forces, the, the, the Hamas terrorists who breached the fence and slaughtered people. Two similar infiltrations from the north. 100, over 150 mortars and rockets fired in that, from that northern front from Hezbollah and, and different people. Um, 20 anti-tank missiles fired at Israelis uh, and Israeli forces, um, gun incidents, um, and six Israelis murdered already, and another 47 injured. That's what's happening on the northern border at the same time as we're dealing um, with Gaza. That's, that's the picture, at least the operational picture, um, as it stands uh, um, at the moment. Um, just from, from literally from uh, minutes ago. Very good. Uh, Boris, I want to point out as a point of context to our viewers that the, uh, the Hezbollah uh, under the command of Hassan Nasrallah, who's been in an underground bunker now for a number of years, uh, takes his, takes his uh, uh, orders, instructions directly from Tehran, directly from uh, the IRGC and the uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, and it's 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 clear to Israel that uh, the Hezbollah, while they have been uh, engaging in cross border skirmishes and, and also some rockets, uh, causing uh, some of the northern communities to be partially uh, evacuated. And uh, that right, and that That's is the number I forgot to give. That there's still some five hundred thousand Israelis living out of their bags, living out of suitcases, wandering around the country. Um, everyone dealing with them and, and, and everyone obviously hosting them. Sorry, that's right. No, no, not at all. This is a, this is a joint effort and uh, an open discussion between us. It's a very important point here that there is a deep concern in the North that the precedent in the South that had been that has been uh, set by the, regret the, the regrettable but successful infiltration, invasion and mass murder by the Hamas uh, has set a brand new precedent for terror organizations where they see that it has happened once uh, and in their view, and they traditionally have over, over have overplayed their hands uh, with this uh, sense of overconfidence that they could do this again in the North. So Israel is on, on major alert. There's a major concern about avoiding uh, this type of infiltration by tunnels, which we've seen there are tunnels coming out from South Lebanon uh, of the Hezbollah into Israel and, and also a border fence. So there's almost, there's a copy paste type of situation, even though the topography is, is very, very different uh, in the North than it is in the South. Having said that, we wanna go and analyze things a little more deeply now, which is why we've asked uh, Dr. Harold Rowe, who's a, a senior fellow here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, a longtime uh, advisor uh, to the Department of Defense uh, uh, in, uh, in Washington, and uh, a fluent Arabic speaker, Farsi speaker, Arabic speaker. And I think Harold is fluent in English, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Dr. Rowe? Well, you have to ask my parents and they're long since not here. So. That's right. <laughs> it's really a delight to have you, Harold. And uh, you know, we have a, a number of, uh, I see the, the folks here uh, on the sidebar, a number of very, um, uh, very important friends of ours, uh, 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 colleagues of ours, uh, mostly from the United States. So this is uh, an important discussion that we, you and I and, and all of us have decided to have, which is we want to bring in uh, the context of Islam to this, uh, to this extraordinarily tragic and dangerous uh, week and a half of activity. And, and we're nowhere near uh, the end of the conflict. We're only in the very beginning of what's uh, of what's uh, going on. So Harold, help us understand, and this is in, in line with the invitation that went out, how Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran begin to see themselves in the context of their Muslim identity, in the context of Islam, uh, which you have, you have shown us since Bernard Lewis was alive, and you was being one of sort of the star protégés of, of Bernard, um, what this means, how we understand 
uh, the way Hamas and Hezbollah understand themselves. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Maurice. Um, let me start with a few things about what is Islam. There, let's say we think of Islam as a religion, and it is. It's a relationship between Muslims and, and their God. Now, the problem is that we in the West say, oh, we've basically progressed beyond religion. And we have a very difficult time understanding how religion empowers others, um, how God empowers, if once you accept God in religion, um, that it empowers you to do things which um, others may not, who are, um, oh, well, I'm just going to worry about myself and stay at home. Now, um, uh, the thing is that in the Muslim world, people have not forgotten their religious identity. I would say from my long, long experience in traveling there, and, and I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have over there so many Muslim friends where I've discussed these things, both Shiite and Sunni. And their Muslim identity, I would argue, supersedes their national identity their tribal identity, um, what languages they speak. It, it's just the way it is. It matters. Now, um, I don't want to talk about how, how they pray and how they fast and whatever like this. I want to talk about Islamic culture. And that is something that we don't see Islam as a culture, and we pay the price for not understanding it. Now, how do Muslims see the non-Muslims? And this will include Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas. Um, it's all basically the same. We are not equals. Uh, the way the ideal world will be is when the uh, Muslims rule the entire world. The non-Muslims are one nation. This is, I'm quoting for a hadith, a, a tradition, which is um, attributed to their prophet Muhammad. Um, that there are only two groups in the world, the Muslims versus the non-Muslims, and they must rule, and they make the decisions. For the, the response is anywhere where Muslims are or have been is theirs forever. And that means that the difference, for example, between Tel Aviv and Nablus is none, because they ruled this entire area for um, uh, you know, over a thousand years. And so it's theirs and it's theirs forever. Non-Muslims who believe in God can live there, but they must remember that they are second-class citizens. They are tolerated. Tolerated may, may sound nice, but the what does toleration mean? The rulers determine what uh, you know, the rules and the rest of us non-Muslims have to live by them. If not, we're either killed or we got to leave. It's one of the two. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all united, uh, all the Muslims. And it's important to see what they do to each other. Um, they, in, the, in Islamic culture, the concept that we have of mercy and compassion and compromise, these things don't exist. Yes, the opening line of the Quran says in Arabic, in the name of God, the Rahman and the Rahim. Now, why did I say this in Arabic? Because those words are translated, the merciful and the compassionate. But from their point of view, that they hope is that God will be merciful and compassionate towards them. But it doesn't mean that they have to be compassionate towards each, towards each other. Now, we may be extremely horrified by what the... Uh, people, the Hamas people did when they crossed the Israeli border and murdered and slaughtered and all these things. We may consider this heinous, but if you look at what they have done historically when they've conquered lands, they've offered people the choice of converting to Islam or death. And death is, you don't just kill someone. There is a word in Arabic that I, I learned from my late mentor, Bernard Lewis, um, which means the best translation in any language 
is German Schadenfreude, which means the special joy that I get in watching you suffer. So when they killed us and when they killed, for example, and, and murdered, and whatever they did, the, uh, the, the Israelis uh, on October 7th, um, they didn't just kill them. There was a special joy they, that they did when they did this, when they killed us, when they killed the Jews. I'm Jewish. Now, how do we know um, that this is a, an important part of Islamic culture? Well, look at what is going on in Syria. We ask ourselves, how can they kill each other the way they are? How can they expel people? And what they have done is unbelievably murderous. It's awful. How can uh, the Muslims have done the same thing in Afghanistan? I could go on and cite many, many, many other areas uh, of the Muslim world. It is, it is very, very terrible. It's hard to live there um, because they don't know in any time whether the people, anybody who perceives them as weak will come and slaughter them, take their wives and children, whatever. No, this I know to a Western mind sounds, uh, it's, it's so disgusting. They don't, Westerners don't want to hear this. They don't want to believe it. And the, and the other thing is that the Muslims have learned uh, uh, like Hamas, the Mahmoud Abbas, the, the the head of the Palestinian Authority, and I must tell you the truth: they, um, if you see how they teach in their books about the Jews, the Christians, the other, the non-Muslim, what you learn is very simple: the difference between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority is very, very little. They really advocate and want the same thing. They may disagree on the means or something like this. But have you heard Mahmoud Abbas condemn what Hamas has done? Not, no, they don't. They support it. And this goes on and on and on. Now, another thing that they have, something called, they have patience. We in the West especially in the computer world. We want it now. You turn on your computer and your email doesn't come up instantly or the video or movie that you want to see right away. You're incensed. That's not the Middle East. Um, they, there's a word which is both, it's in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. It's of Arabic origin, sabr, which means patience. Patience means I will wait until I see you, that you are weak. And then I will pounce. And they never, never have, a, they don't have a concept of putting bygones be bygones. If God forbid, Dan, that your great grandfather Diker, Diker killed my great grandfather, Road, we are, I'm not, we, you and I are, are very, very close friends, but we're not in the Middle East. I am in the end a Road and you're a Diker. And if my, I have never avenged my great grandfather's death because I've, I'm, my, I'm a weak tribe and you're a strong dry, tribe. I brood and I wait and I have patience as long as it will take. And eventually when I'm strong enough, my people, the road people will get you back and any of the male members which carry the name Diker in your clan are finished. This is what goes on in the Muslim world. It's a, a tribal identity. I don't use the word tribal in a negative sense. It is a group identity that we don't have. Now, <clears throat> let's take two examples of this. The most recent is um, if you take the people in Atif Azab, how do we call this in English? The, the area around the Gaza Strip where the, there are so many Jewish towns, villages, and, and whatever. They, a lot of them were leftists. And they, they, they were very much for, they, they, they had all these Palestinian friends. In fact, some of these Palestinian friends, in fact, many would come across every day and they worked in the houses of people. For example, um, is it Kibbutz Be'eri, the one that were, where so many people were slaughtered? And what did they do? And these were friends and the 
the the Muslims there, and they're all Muslims, there are no Christians who, to the best of my knowledge, who were working there. They, they were wonderful people and nice and sweet. And we in the West think when you're nice and sweet, that everything is fine, that we're friends. But that is not the case in the Muslim world. They would go home at night and they memorized house by house what the houses were, who lived in the house, how many children, who ate Friday night dinner at other houses. Was there a dog? And they patiently mapped out the entire area for Hamas. And, uh, and when, when, they, when they came across on October the 11th, they had these maps, these terrorists, and they went house to house and they knew what they were looking for. And that's where they slaughtered, where they murdered. And when they murdered, they just didn't go in and shoot people. They did what they did. They could take off arms and limbs they would tore, knife them. They would do awful, awful things. They would humiliate them. They would rape them, and not just the women. Now, this I'm not saying this is part of Islam, but it is part of the Islamic culture. It's not the religious aspect. And we in the West don't want to see this. Now, I can tell you, having, you know, I worked, you know, in the Pentagon and was in the White House and all over the American government. And when, um, you bring up uh, what, for example, Iran, whose constitution, it's clear when you read with the basic thumb, the goal is, the, I think it's Article 136, but I'm not sure, is to spread Islam through jihad throughout the entire world. Jihad means one thing. It means by the sword, meaning that's how you capture something. And the interesting word in Arabic for for um, Muslim conquests is called futuhat from the word fatah, which means to open. You're opening up a land for Islam. And once you do that, it's Muslim forever. Now let's look at the Saudi flag for a moment. It'll just another example here. You it's a beautiful green flag with some nice calligraphy written in the center, which is in Arabic, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. It is his messenger. It doesn't say prophet. It says messenger. Now, that's all fine and dandy. They're Muslims. Again, it's a religious identity, but there's something else on that flag. And what is that flag? Underneath that is a big sword. Now, their prophet fought with a sword or a dagger. And if you notice so many of the killings done by the Muslim terrorists is done with a dagger, with a sword. They're imitating their part. That's how they do it. And uh, you know, we may not like this. This is not merciful and compassionate. And although they incorrectly translate the word in Arabic, as I mentioned before, rahma, um, this root means, it sounds, they translate as compassion, but it's God's compassion on man, not man's compassion on man. And when I mentioned patience before, they can wait forever. Not only Dan, until I'm strong enough to get one of the male members of your Daiku tribe, if I all of a sudden I'm, I'm powerful, rich, militarily strong, I can get your son, God forbid, uh, whom, whom I love. He's a great guy. He's a Daiku and I'm, I'm not. I'm a rogue and I have a, um, I have, I'm brooding about what your great grandfather did to mine. Let me just give one more thing, and I think I should shut up a bit, or maybe two more things, and I'll, I should let, you know, Dan, you should really ask the questions that you want. Besides patiently mapping the area for 30 years, um, uh, they, uh, when I say they can wait forever, Islam began to retreat. It began to lose in Europe, it advanced and vast until the year 1683 when the Muslims, and that was the Ottoman Turks, had advanced to Vienna. And on, uh, rather, and in 1633, 1683, excuse me, the Muslims lost a decisive battle in Vienna. Uh, Vienna was the front line defense against Islam. The only reason 
it was saved is that other the, the Catholic poles at the time came and rescued them and and destroyed the and rather in really the Islamic forces the Muslim Islamic Muslim is what counts here now it's interesting everything in Islam also symbolism is everything why the dates they choose the date on 1683 in the Western calendar is 9/11 September 11th well no why you know, you say, oh, my God, what is, I said symbolism. On what day did Osama bin Laden take down the towers in New York? He right. was writing a wrong to the Muslim world. We stole their land, their perception, because they were already at Vienna. So it was theirs. We don't like this. Maybe one other thing. And then, Dan, I'm, it's your turn, please. Salman Rushdie the guy who wrote the satanic verses that in, I think it was 1989 or towards the end of the eighties, the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran put a pronounced a death sentence on him. Now we in the West say, Oh, you know, and in the beginning he was guarded well and he hid himself well, but, but the Muslims were brooding. And what happened all of a sudden after 33 years, he felt comfortable. And what, and he was uh, uh, in a public performance and in a public event in New York City. And all of a sudden, a guy jumps up on the stage with a dagger and starts to, uh, and, and, and mutilates him. He lost an eye, that is, um, Rushdi. It's unending this battle. This is the way Islamic culture is. Then. Thank you, Harold, uh, for that uh, comprehensive preview. We invite our colleagues and friends across the seas to ask questions or make comments. It's also uh, an open discussion, uh, and uh, we deeply appreciate the engagement. I want to start with a question by Howard Weisman, who's a distinguished and a very longtime member of the board of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Howard asked a, uh, a really serious question here. Is there not a difference between Muslims and Islamists, Harold? Um, I want to quote Winston Churchill on this, on Islam. And I, you'll excuse me for reading, it's just two lines. Individual Muslims may show splendid qualities, but their influence, the, but the influence of their religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. No stronger retrograde force exists in the world. Now, um, you know, uh, uh, that sounds absolutely horrible. Truth is, it is. But you know where I learned about this quote? I learned about it. There are many Muslims, and you have a remarkable guy working um, at the... Um, uh, uh, at the uh, JCPA, and the it is people like him, and I, I mean, I think I have, met, as I said probably before, I have many more Muslim friends than, than Christian friends, and what I'm saying is the result of conversations with them. There are wonderful Muslims, but here is the difference: that they know that if they publicly say what I'm saying, which they are, they taught me. They will be killed because they will be understood as renegades, as um, uh, apostates. And the punishment for apostasy in Islam is death. And they don't like that. But obviously, they don't like it. And um, they're afraid. I'm going to give you an incident that once happened to me, and I think that really answers. It's, are all Muslims the way I describe? They live in this culture. No, they aren't. Again, you and I, Dan, have wonderful Muslim friends, and we know that. And, and But they say, listen, be careful, because, okay, what happens to me? I'm on a panel in Paris, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago. And I'm, I'm, there was a, uh, a, a, an Algerian, uh, a guy from Algerian origin, French Muslim, 
who was a, a wonderful friend. We had been friends, my God, 10, 15, whatever it was, years. And we knew each other very well. We had knocked down, drag out discussions. And we were from us on the same page. We agreed about what Islamic culture was all about. And I, even today, I won't mention his name and you'll see why. I was, I spoke first and I said more or less what I just said right now. And then he got up after me and it attacked me unbelievably so, saying all sorts of things that I know from our knockdown, drag out discussions for years. That's not how we thought. And I was like, how could you do this? Number one, you're a friend. I'm a, I'm a white Westerner. I Westerner. I think like a Westerner. And afterwards, I looked at him and I said his name. I said, I know that you don't think, you don't agree with what you said. You, he, and he said to me, Harold, please, please understand. You're a Jew. They expect you to say these things. But if I say what I believe, which is best in essence, what you said, they will kill me. And I want to live. And I sort of half in shock said to him, I said, X his name. I said, um, I'm glad you did what you did to me then, because I you're my friend and I want you to live. I need you. We don't understand. I we, re we refuse to understand. And until we see them as they see themselves, we're going to have the attacks over and over again that um, we just witnessed on October 7th and what they are probably doing to the Israeli hostages right now. I wouldn't want to be one. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's terrible. I hope that I have addressed the question Yeah, a um, couple things, Harold, uh, when we get to Robert Goldberg's question uh, in a minute, in a second, I wanted to ask a question about what looks like an apparent contradiction. Sure, there are many. Right. And uh, I, I remember that, that Bernard used to say in the Middle East, nothing makes sense and everything makes sense. He, he would say over lunch in Tel Aviv restaurants where he had his apartment, uh, that he went to we, where, he, where we joined him for three months a year. Here's the apparent contradiction. The Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, the Emiratis, and even to a degree, the Sudanese have made an accommodation for, a Jew, for, for Israel as you know, accepting Israel for what it is in its own self-definition. Now, according to the definition of Islam, as you presented it today, it would be impossible for them to accommodate a Jewish sovereign entity in the lands of Islam. And yet you have normalization, you have full peace agreements, normalization agreements with the Abraham Accord countries, then you have sort of a government to government, or I think more accurately stated, army to army peace agreement between Egypt, Israel, and Jordan, Israel. But having said that, there still are formal treaties of peace between those you know, uh, six countries, let's say. On the other hand, the, uh, the Palestinian Arab leadership headed by the PLO on the one hand, the Fatah, and represented by the PA, in Ramallah, and then and of course, and the murderous uh, jihadi genocidal uh, Hamas a, a, with Iranian backing in Gaza and also parts of the Dan Samaria, Ref they, they behave the way they behave. So how do we square the lack of the, the accommodation with the lack of accommodation from the point of view of Islam? I would argue as follows. There's a point beyond which that all the leaders that you mentioned can't go. They are looking for one thing, and it's there's an Arabic proverb that I wake up in the morning and I want to see that the people I was with yesterday are still strong because I need to look for them before strong. They have things that I need. I can, they will protect me and that I can count on them. And at, at all times, they're also looking around at other options. 
I'll give you a, a historical one. Um, and that is in World War I, we've heard galore that uh, Lawrence of Arabia came and he dealt with the Hashemites in the desert and they were fighting for um, Britain uh, or with the British and everything is hunky-dory. But there's something else that happened. And that is when the British all of a sudden at one point stopped and they were concerned, the Ottomans who were on the other side, the head of the Ottoman Empire at the time, the, the, the not the Sultan, but one of the, 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 either the Grand Vizier or the Prime Minister, his name escapes me at the moment, sent a message to um, uh, uh, Hussein, who was the um, leader. Uh, of the Hashemites in uh, um, uh, in Mecca at the time, and said, "Well, you see, the British are not; they're abandoning you. Um, how about rejoining us?" And that's, and they that, and this is what we're seeing all over the place. If they can are can be protected, they will, and if and we have things to offer them, and I admire the Emiratis especially, who say straightforwardly, we have common interests, it has nothing to do whether I like you or not. They can, like their prophet did, they can sign or make an agreement because signing doesn't matter in the Middle East, in Middle Eastern culture. They can make an agreement. You put off for a long time until we're strong, then look to continue the fight. But I think, um, uh, uh, and I want to tell you the, some of the people that I admire the most are the UAE. I want to quote um, the foreign minister uh, who some years ago, there was a conference and um, uh, a, a white woman, I think British by accent, is asking a question. And the foreign minister at the conference, it was, the conference was in Arabic. But she has some Western question about it, like all getting along and all that. And um, uh, the foreign minister, Abdullah, he's still the foreign minister today, a remarkable man, said, um, he took the microphone and, and be started to speak English, which he speaks better than I do, and it's my native language. And he, um, and, she, and she starts to speak English, but he starts to speak, and she says, I will, speak in English so that you can understand what I'm saying. No translation here. I, um, I, I, okay, there will come a day when we will see far more radical extremists and terrorists coming out of Europe. They're talking Muslim here. He's talking Muslim because of the lack of decision-making, trying to be politically correct, or assuming that they in the West know the Middle East and that they know Islam um, better, that they know, and they know the others, meaning all Muslims, far better than we do. And I'm sorry, he says, that's pure ignorance. I think I might have missed an and there or something, but that's what, what I'm saying is, this is what they are up against, and they know their countries and their culture. And when Israel looks weak, um, and what Hamas did at that on October seventh made Israel look unbelievably weak, and what Ham, uh, and and what the Gulf and everybody else is looking at, and the Saudis, they are looking to see does Israel have does it does it have what it takes to uh, get back its strength to obliterate these uh, these terrorists? That's their word. They don't use fundamentalists because fundamentalist is, is the way all Muslims should be. They have fundamentals of Islam. It's what matters. So they won't use it. That is the, the, the Gulfies. Um, and they, because they know, uh, they, they don't want to give their enemies, which are the radicals and extremists. Um, and if those radicals and extremists are the strongest, people have no choice. And they have uh, it. Al? We, we, we're, we're short on time and long on Sorry. questions. Uh, no, because the, our, our viewers and participants are fascinated with the conversation. So I would just ask if we could keep the uh, answers just a little bit shorter so we can get Stop me, Dan. Okay, you know questions. me. Yeah. Okay. I okay. looked for somebody with a cane behind you, but they disappeared. 
uh, to listen to the answer. That's uh, <laughs> my mother-in-law is almost a hundred, and she has a cane. <laughs> anyway, let me uh, bring uh, Robert. Uh, Robert Goldberg has a, a very a compelling question. Uh, given the long memory of Islamists, as you mentioned, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, do you think that the requirement here is the uh, the conquest uh, of those Islamists in order to turn the tide? Um, from the, the beginning of Islam, which is 1400 years ago, this, these sort of terrorists raised their head and they did all sorts of things. The only way they were ever put down 100% is by being eradicated. There is no other alternative or alternative. And uh, of the Americans was, oh, well, they told me this and told me that they don't care about the words. They care about actions. Right. Harold, is, can I can ask? Yeah, please, please do. Can, is there any difference? We saw yesterday the, the the outcome of the of the meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Is there any difference uh, from an Islamic point of view between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, Fatah? Do they see this differently? Because you no, but you clearly they see it the same. Hamas. They see it the same. Their vocabulary and what they do may be a little. Different. Their goal is exactly the same as the phrase is in Arabic. They want the, what, what it is from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, which rhymes beautifully in Arabic. Absolutely. And by the way, that what, we've, uh, what we've exposed at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and you know this, Harold, because the book was written with your assistance back in 2018 uh, and has received a lot of exposure since we... Uh, were interviewed on Fox and Mark Levin with this book called Students for Justice in Palestine Exposed, Hamas on Campus. Uh, we have, that is the refrain from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's what Hamas says in the Gaza Strip. And that's what the cheerleaders for Hamas say on hundreds of US campuses. Uh, we're yes. updating that book now. We're updating that booklet right now. And in fact, if anybody on the call knows of a sponsor, we need a sponsor for this project. This will be a very widely distributed book in all of the in all of the Hillel's across the United States and among Jewish leadership in order uh, and media uh, and beyond in order to expose the fact that Hamas, exactly the type of Islamist thinking and action, Harold, that you're raising now is actually being raised, supported, cheerleaded, uh, cheer-led, uh, and and um, inspired on university campuses across the United States and Canada. But I want to add a word of caution, Dan. I know and I understand that at the moment the focus is on Hamas because Hamas and the terrorists from the Gaza Strip just carried out this massacre. The solution to this problem cannot be introducing the Palestinian Authority um, to take Never, over. never. There is no difference between them. There's no light of day between Hamas and Fatah. Their and that goal is, is the same. On everybody. Their goal is the same. No, this is an American, because they think that Mahmoud Abbas, who is himself, frankly, uh, 200 years ago, of Jewish origin, um, uh, they think that the, the Palestinian Authority, which represses, oppresses its own, the people in in Judea and Samaria, in the West Bank. They, the people there hate the Palestinian Authority. So they're going to go from one oppressor in Gaza to another oppressor. That leaves the problem. It's the same problem. It's the way it is. And that's By the way, I just want to mention, Harold, one thing President Biden said in his remarks today in Germany, uh, one, that uh, the Hamas didn't shoot straight from the hospital uh, and that was a mistake, even though it wasn't the Hamas, it was the Islamic Jihad that shot the rocket into their own hospital, uh, killing, uh, uh, killing uh, 100, uh, 100 people. Some people. Some, some people. We don't know how many were killed. And then the other, the other point that he made was to distinguish between the Hamas and the PA, as uh, Maurice has been working on for years and just warned us about. It's a very important point here because the president... Uh, has underscored his support for moving the Palestinian Authority back into the Gaza Strip. That was why the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian Authority, canceled the meeting 
yesterday in Jordan, which was supposed to have been a summit or a mini summit, including the neighbors, meaning Jordan, Egypt, Palestinian Authority, and others from the Gulf, and the Palestinian Authority uh, chairman, Mahmoud Abbas, would have nothing of it. He didn't even want to go. He wouldn't even go to Gaza because he understands that inside five minutes, he would be hanging off a street, uh, uh, you know, off a street side a light post. of a light, a lamppost, a light post in the, in the middle of Gaza City. This just goes to underscore the type of misunderstanding of the way uh, Islam sees itself in, in the Palestinian context. But that seems well, to listen, be uh, the, uh, America. So in the State Department, that's who are presenting these uh, um, ideas to the president. That's who's dictating this this idea of the Palestinian Authority uh, filling in. How do, how do we get over that? No, we can't get over that. Here's the thing. In the end, Israel is going to have to do what it needs to do to survive. Um, um, we these people they when they hear for example during all the years that that I worked in in government again my specialty is Islam and I may be a Jew but I I I'm honest to God I think I think at times I know a lot more about Islam than about Judaism and um, when you bring up let's call them inconvenient facts um, they this well it's uncomfortable. And, um, and they don't want to deal with this. And I would say that's also a problem with many, many Jews in the United States. We need to find compromise. There is no concept of Ar in Arabic of compromise. When you negotiate is when you win and you, the victor, dictate the terms to the losers. That's the way it works. We may not like it, but that's, that's it. And why, you know, we think, this phrase, Palestine shall, river to the sea, Palestine will be free. We think this is like, um, oh, it's just a slogan. No, it's not. It's what they think and what they are still working for. Now, I've had in Israel, I, I've taught three summers in a university course on, um, on the Islamic mentality based on all the years that I ran around the Muslim world, learning the cultures, the languages, whatever, trying to find a way to make peace as I understood it. Um, people of three generations in Israel and from Taibe, for example, I had some students um, and uh, they, they, they said to me, um, this is our land. It's ours. Why is it their land? You ask? Well, we, it became our land in, in 6, uh, 37, 38. Fine. Uh, uh, so it's your land forever. That's the attitude. We have no role here. We, the Jews, in the Middle East, except to kowtow, uh, to cower to power, and the power must be Muslim. All right, Howard, I want to ask the, the final question on behalf of uh, Lise, uh, Lise Gorston, asked sort of a, a very uh, important question as a summary question, because we're almost uh, we're out of time. Um, and the question is, uh, in her words, given the reality of Islamic values, what's the best policy approach for Israel, and I'm just going to add, for Israel and the West, U.S. Department of Defense, fully cognizant of what you, Harold, have described and assessed. Um, uh, the no, they're not. They're not fully cognizant, Dan. What's the best policy? Um, the, our problem isn't necessarily with the neighbors. The problem is that they, the State Department, all the, the American government uh, writ large, uh, and and I want to say a lot of the senior establishment uh, in, the, in, in Israel, among the military and the intelligence, I, I can't believe, since I've been out of government, I've been to all sorts of conferences and met a lot of these people. I don't know what world they're living in. And I will just really say one other thing. When I, the first time I started to teach, and the only people in the Middle East who really are studying Middle East now are basically bitchonistim, they're security types. And people, and they were in their 20s and early 30s. And during the breaks, they would say, you know, what you're describing and what you saw in, you know, in the Muslim world is exactly what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. But our superiors in the military and, and whatever intelligence, whatever, they don't want to hear this. And maybe I think I can summarize this. That Many years ago, I, I used to spend a lot of summers in Kibbutz Soha, which is across from Bechemish. And um, later I gave a, a lecture 
on, on how the Palestinians, excuse me, how the PLO at the time was not part of it, you know, had not been brought in back yet in by the Americans and the Israelis. Um, I, how they, I described how it was. And a woman came up to me afterwards and said to me, I, um, I hear what you're saying. You convinced me, but I will not accept it. That sounds a contradiction again there. He said, the reason I will not accept it is that if I accept what you are saying, I will have to, my whole world view, I will have to change. And that I'm not prepared to do. And that is the danger that Israel faces right now. I have no doubt that there are people uh, uh, the, uh, around the prime minister and maybe the prime minister himself, who I really don't know personally, who understand exactly what I just said, but they have to deal with the um, intelligence and, and, and military bureaucracies, which I cannot prove this, but I know it happened in the United States, that a lot of times the bureaucrats hid information because they didn't want the people on top to get it, because if they did, they would, oh my God, we have to adopt a policy different from what the bureaucrats in the military in, in the intelligence agencies wanted. So we had to, had to hide it from. This is the dilemma we face. Uh, I don't know how to handle it, um, except that, you know, God willing, the, the young people in Israel, on the other hand, I think are wonderful. Um, they are very clear. They understand what they're up against. And eventually, God willing, they will take over. And maybe we have to wait. We have to have sabr. We have to have patience. And in the meantime, we must be resolute. Now, what I, maybe one of the things that I found, found very interesting, Yael Golan, the Meretz X number two in the uh, Israeli military, he was a Meretz a Knesset member. Um, he completely went the other way. He said, I talked to my friends in North Tel Aviv and in all, all the, the, the right thinking people who believe they own the country where you are right now. Um, and uh, what they're saying about, you got you to level Hamas, you got to level this. He said, what is the difference between that? And um, was it Ben Gvir who said, we have to level Hawara, the village um, uh, which was shooting all sorts of Israelis, slaughtering them. Uh, and that's a very interesting thing. And I would only hope that the, that, that if people like in this case, I just quoted Yael Golan, but there are, there are a bunch of others. It's like, now we know. The question is, what is Israel going to do about it? I'm not a military man. I'm not an intelligence man. But Israel is going to have to figure that out for himself. And when it comes to if there is a battle between what the Americans think and the Israelis think, I want to tell you Ameri what American history has been since uh, uh, basically the, almost the Korean War, is that they run. The, they ran from Vietnam. The Americans ran in Afghanistan. We look weak. And um, Israel has to say, do we want to suffer that same feat? fate? I think what um, you described about Yair Golan now, uh, uh, Harold, is something very, very frightening. This is a person who was the deputy chief of staff of the IDF. And if it took the murder of and slaughter of 1,400 people for him to open his eyes and realize that there's no way to negotiate and no way to be friends with these people, then, then I, I fear we're in a bad situation. Um, I would argue I, the opposite. I would argue the opposite. Uh, uh, one Harold, second, one second, one second, one second, one second, Maurice. What did you want to say, Harold? I would argue the opposite. When these people wake up, Look, I'm a former rabid leftist. You know, I'm 74 now, but in my, up to my you know, early 20s, I was a leftist. The question is when you wake up and when you wake up and you have been blunted by the, uh, the other side, um, maybe it's a good thing. I, he's not alone because there are a lot of people saying things like that who are the former leaders of the, uh, the protests against the regime. By the way, please, one other, please, one last comment. Why did they attack the Hamas people believe they could attack now? The major reason from my own reading and talking with people is that when we had these um, demonstrations in Israel of the people, again, the 
intelligence, uh, former heads of intelligence, former um, military leaders supporting these demonstrations in Tel Aviv for, I don't care what the reason was, basically their anti-prime minister. Then, then um, uh, and people were warning me, Muslims, this is going to bring an attack. They didn't say when, they didn't say by whom, they didn't know. But they saw weakness. And Middle Easterners, when they see weakness, they pounce, they strike. And that's it. Yeah, that's the story of where we are today, clearly. Uh, yes. The conceptions have been massacred. Not only men, women, and children have been massacred, but the conceptions that we've lived with for over three yes. decades have been massacred. And it's going to require a lot of new thinking, which yes. is solution-centric thinking. It's a different type of thinking. It's cultural yes. Ideological thinking. There will be there will be a type of thinking of how to create pragmatic, humane, dignified uh, political arrangements for our Palestinian neighbors in, in, in Gaza as well as in Judea and Samaria. But it will be very different from the type of thinking that's gone on until now. Let me thank you, Dr. Harold Rode, uh, for a masterclass in uh, in political self identity within Islam. We'll look forward to seeing you here in Jerusalem soon. My dear friend and colleague, Maurice Hirsch, thank you very much. And uh, our, our, uh, our newest uh, professional, Yara Siegel, who's with us and uh, former professional with the uh, foreign ministry. We're delighted to have you with us in the room. Daniel Levin, who keeps us who keeps us sane and technically connected and graphically professional at times. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. If I, uh, again, if any of you are able to support our war room. We are engaged with the only organization, the only center engaging really in uh, perception, in perception operations, in cognitive, um, uh, trying to confront and overcome this disinformation warfare by rebranding the enemy and rebranding ourselves. This is a conflict between good and evil. It is not a conflict yes. to territorial demands. Uh, and therefore, if you look at our website every day, you'll see new videos uh, that are, are strategically uh, produced. They're not reaction videos, but they're videos with actually a strategic message behind them. Take a look. If you can help us at jcpa.org, you can email me directly. Any contribution fully tax deductible will be welcome. Uh, we need your help in order to expand our operation. We've been doing well, but we can really do well with your assistance. Please join us every day at four. Tomorrow we're having, we're okay tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow we're tomorrow. having online and we'll see you all next week. I'll be in the United States uh, next week, but we'll be operating from, uh, from there, from California.